Hi YouTube, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can find me on the web, CaltonCutlery.com. Alright, so I uh, believe this is video number seven on the um, making a new knife pattern um, uh, series, I guess, um, where we're taking, you know, my, uh, or, you know, the neck knife, uh, the, the Carter pattern neck knife that I've made, oh goodness, no, at least hundreds of, if maybe not even a thousand yet, I'm not sure. But anyway, since I hardly ever carry this pattern as a neck knife, I carry it as a belt knife, um, you know, like this right here. Um, I figured we'd go ahead and, well, you guys know, I mean, if you've been following along, we're making a whole new pattern from start to finish. The, uh, the six of the EDC belt knife, whatever it is that we're going to call this pattern, um, they're all in the kiln. And I guess we'll, uh, we'll take a look at those here in a second. Um, they've been through their normalizing phase and they've been through their subcritical annealing cycles. All right, so they are ready to heat up for the quench. So uh, the quench, um, that's where we harden the blade. Okay, so we, we take the blade or the, the steel as we get it from the man manufacturer and we shape it. You know, we make it into, you know, we make it look like what we want our knife to look like, right? Once we have it shaped, whether that's through forging or stock removal, or forging and then stock removal, you know, whatever it is that we're going to do, then we do our heat cycles, where we take that steel and we prep it for the hardening step, okay? Now, to harden that steel, what we do is we heat it up to a critical temperature, maybe a hair above, then we leave it there to make sure that that heat gets all the way to the center of the blade, okay, and everything gets a chance to equal out and get all nice and happy. All right, and then we pull it out and we cool it off really, really fast. This is 1095. I've heard that we have less than one second to get it from critical temperature to very freaking cool um, in a second or less. You know, I'm no metallurgist. I'm just a guy that makes a whole bunch of knives, right? <clears throat> so, um, so anyway, we're going to go over, before we go over like the, well, Actually, while I'm thinking about that, let's go ahead and introduce you. We've got some guests in the shop for this week. Um, I, I'm not sure if I, I've uh, showed this on YouTube yet or not, but my wife, you know, with a new place, um, you know, it's out in the county and we've got room and everything, and she has always wanted chickens. Now, granted, this, now be easy on me here, okay? I am not a carpenter, but this is a chicken coop that I built for, and... Her little chickens are all up in there. Now I'm not sure how the the camera is going to pick up. There's a uh, a heat lamp in there. Actually, you know what? Let's just unplug that heat lamp. Hang on just a second. <clears throat> all right. I'm sure they'll be okay for. A couple of seconds with a video shop or video shot. There they are. Uh, don't ask me what breeds they are. I don't know. Um, you know, she's the one that's kind of really gotten into this whole chicken thing. Um, you know, I'm just the dude that uh, that builds the. I built her a brooding box. I think is what it's called. It was like a tank that we uh, kept the chickens in inside. There you go. Now you can see them. All. Um, yeah, some sort of a tank. Uh, built a lid for it so that you know the dogs couldn't get in there uh, built the chicken coop um, you know that's uh, that's kind of my whole deal with the, the chicken project let's turn that heat lamp back on so apparently those chickens are gonna stay with us for a week here in the shop and then um, and then they're gonna go if the camera can see that but they're going to go right out there there's the chicken run there and then the chicken coop is going to go somewhere right around in there and then i guess they'll hang out there uh for as long as we have them i guess okay so <clears throat> so it's going to be a little bit of a mix okay so you can't really talk about quenching oils or quenching temperatures or quenching tanks without talking a little bit about heat treat so it's going to be kind of a mix of both. <clears throat> so you may end up having to watch this, you know, several times to, uh, you know, to get the, all of the good that you can out of it. 
All right, so we have got our knives in their, their happy, relaxed state, okay? So the next thing that we need to do is we need to take those blades and then we need to get that steel just as hard as we possibly can, okay? Once we get that steel as hard as we possibly can, then we will, uh, and we do that by heating it to uh, the critical temperature or hair above, um, and then cooling it very quickly, uh, in this case in oil. Then we're going to let it sit like that until we get all of the blades done. Okay, because remember we're uh, we're not just just doing one knife here. I think uh, we're doing like 30 or 40 of them. Can't remember what what the count was, but um, we're going to get all those blades quenched, and then we're going to, as a group, put them into the tempering oven, which is you know our our fancy high tech toaster oven, and then draw some of that hardness back out so that we have a, a blade that is. Um, got plenty of hardness to hold an edge for a good amount of time but yet has a little bit of toughness to uh, withstand normal use and a little bit of abuse not very much okay um, now abuse that is a whole nother video there <clears throat> and I suppose I should probably put that on my to-do list the difference between use hard use and abuse is different things to different people and um, so we're going to build these to where the normal person using the knife as a knife will get a good uh, you know a good number of years worth of service out of the blade okay without any real big surprises now you start using the tip as a screwdriver and you start using it as a pry bar to paint it, uh, open up like painted shut windows and stuff hey you're on your own there all right but what we're into right now is, is the heat treating part. Okay, so I guess the first thing, well, you know, they're all kind of correlated. So let's go over quenching oils first. <clears throat> we'll go over quenching oils, then we'll go over quench tanks, uh, then we'll go over how to find your quench temperature. Um, yeah. All right, so for 1095, let's see where you're at there. Let's get you up here a little bit. So for 1095, and also for um, I've got some W1. Uh, they gave me a stick of that when I went in that uh, that Forge and Fire show, and I've played with it uh, with some straight razors, and that's about all I've used it for. Um, but for 1095 and for W1 and for 440C, in fact, I use straight up grocery store canola oil. Okay. I don't think it matters whether it's uh, Wesson canola oil or great value canola oil, okay? What I look for when I go to buy canola oil for heat treating knives is I want, um, you know, a food grade canola oil, something that you can cook with and eat it, right? And then I want a good jug, you know, I mean a, a fairly, um, you know, thick plastic container that it comes in, okay? Because once I get done quenching with this oil, it's going to go right back into that jug. And this jug might be here for a year, you know, until it gets wore out and then it's time to replace it and get another jug. Um, and that's it, okay? Just straight up grocery store canola oil. Now, I can already hear the guys that are saying, hey, you know, use an engineered quenching oil, right? I guess if you want to, you know, I mean, there's there's nothing against that. I mean, this whole video is about how I do stuff. Now, the biggest reason that I use canola oil for quenching um, 1095W1 and 440C, the biggest reason, I mean total, is because this stuff is food grade, okay? You put this in a pan, and you heat it up, and you throw food in there, and you cook with it, and then you eat it, right? Okay, which, and if you cook like me, you know, a lot of times you heat this up way too hot and it ends up getting burned. And you still eat it because, well, by that point, you know, I mean, it's too late to go to the grocery store or go out to eat or anything. So you're stuck eating burnt canola oil, right? And I'm still alive. And I haven't really noticed anything big that, you know, health-wise that has come up from eating burned canola oil. Which tells me that... And you'd have to talk to a doctor or somebody, you know, uh, really about this. But 
I have a hard time believing that if something is, if you can ingest it and eat the stuff, right? And eat it even when it's burnt and it doesn't hurt you. I have a hard time thinking that the smoke that comes off of this when you plunge a 1500 degree knife blank into it is going to harm you. It seems to me like that's going to be an awful lot safer than doing the same thing with a petroleum oil. Okay, so um, so not only do I think that the canola oil is better for or the smoke that comes off the canola oil is better for your health than what comes off of a, an engineered quenching oil, um, but I also it's also cheap or inexpensive. You know, I mean, I think this whole gallon right here is like six or seven bucks at Walmart. Um, which is way cheaper than uh, an engineered like Parks 50 or something. It's readily available. You can run down to Walmart or Safeway or wherever and pick this stuff up anywhere you want to go. <coughs> it's renewable and green, you know, I mean, if that makes a difference to you. Uh, you know, this came from, you know, some sort of a plant, you know, not from a long dead dinosaur. Um, if you spill it, <laughs> it's... You know, I mean, you're spilling a plant-based product, you know, no big deal, right? I mean, you clean it up, throw the, uh, the towels in the garbage can, and, you know, I mean, away you go. It's not a hazardous type product. Um, <clears throat> so, um, I guess with that, the quenching fluids that I use here in the shop are canola oil. I also use vegetable oil for 5160 and for the post-forging quenches on uh, 5160 and 1095 and 52100, that, um, that tall tank that I have over there, well, you've seen it in other videos. Um, it's a tall vertical tank that I built for um, um, heat treating double-edged swords and daggers and stuff. Um, it's usually filled with vegetable oil, and that's since it's right next to the forge, that's what I use for post-forging quenches, and I keep vegetable oil in there. So vegetable oil for 52100, or the post-forging quenches on 52100 and 5160 and 1095. Um, <clears throat> the only engineered quenching fluid that I use is Texaco Type A, and I use that just for 52100. And the reason, the biggest reason that I do that is because uh, my friend Ed Fowler, um, I ended up purchasing like five or seven gallons of it off of him. That's what he developed his heat treat for 52100 with. Um, that's pretty much the heat treat that I use for 52100, and so his oil was available. Apparently, it's been discontinued a long time ago. You can't get it anymore, so that's what I use for 52100. The seven gallons of it that I have, uh, or the five gallons that I have of it left, will likely last me through the end of my knife making career. <clears throat> if for some reason it doesn't, um, and I'm forced to uh, develop a um, you know, a new heat treat or a tweak the heat treat based on a different uh, quenching oil, more than likely it'll be vegetable oil. Um, and any new steels that I uh, uh, end up starting to work with, um, I feel strongly enough about the, uh, the benefits of uh, vegetable-based oils that I'll probably um, develop any future uh, heat treats around vegetable-based oils and not in... Uh, petroleum-based oils, okay? So, <clears throat> um, and you know, an awful lot of that has to do with that cough that you just heard me do, okay? I mean, um, you know, I used to smoke a lot, like two to four packs a day a lot, right? Now, if that wasn't bad enough, you know, I was working in a shop that had, you know, a garage door for cars, and it had a door between the house and the garage. No windows, no filtration system, you know, dust everywhere. I mean, I really didn't notice how bad it was until we moved. Um, and so, um, um, you know, I did end up getting, uh, the doctor said I've got some uh, mild COPD, which apparently that's going to stay with me for the rest of my life. So, um, you know, and breathing an awful lot of that quenching smoke, um, you know, I always did pretty good. Had the garage door open, had fans going, um, you know, so... I never, but then again, even with the fans going and everything, the next day I would always uh, notice a little bit of, you know, extra cough or, you know, lungs feel a little bit tired, that kind of stuff, even with the canola oil. Um, especially on a cold day when, um, you know, I couldn't have the garage door all the way open. But anyway, so I truly believe that your vegetable based oils are 
um, are the way to go for knife makers. Um, <clears throat> if you're working in a uh, like a heavy industry type of setup, you know, where you're uh, like like a like a heat treating outfit or something like that, right? Okay, where those guys have got the money to have you know huge um, um, uh, fans, you know, and and like the whole nine yard setup for petroleum based quenching fluids. You know, if you've got enough airflow and everything, and you're wearing, you know, maybe a, a appropriate mask that'll filter out that kind of stuff, you know, hey, you know, those guys, they work on a whole different level than us, you know, normal knife maker types. And play by a different set of rules when it comes to that also. <coughs> but anyway, so that's why I like the, the vegetable-based quenching fluid. Now, with canola oil, You'll notice the two of these, the two of these jugs. This one's brand new, and this one's been used for I don't know a thousand knives or so, something like that. So you notice the difference in the color. Okay, um, a lot of that difference in the color has to do with uh, you know just use burning it. You know, I mean, every time you're putting a fifteen hundred degree blade in this stuff, you know you're burning some of it, and that you know it goes into the you know it stays in the oil you know use it from batch to batch as far as the cooling power of canola oil um, when you get it <coughs> straight out of the jug it works good okay when after you've heated it up and you know to 200 degrees or so, you know, when you uh, go ahead and go through a batch of knives, it works more better, all right? Now, what I think is happening is that, I think what happens is, is that fresh, it's got quite a bit of water in it, okay? As you use it, you cook that water out. Once you get the water cooked out, then it performs at its best, and then <clears throat> over a period of you know, about a year or so, um, it seems to me like it starts breaking down and it doesn't work as good anymore. Okay, so um, in fact, that's what we're going to do on this one right here is because uh, this is a fresh thing of oil. And I've actually never, um, never kept track of how long that I, I used it. Um, there's a magic marker. There's one. And today's date is the fifth. So we're going to write down on here four, five, twenty. And then we're going to write it in a different place. Four, five, twenty. And then it's also going to be on the camera or uh, on YouTube. And if you guys hadn't noticed, you know, I use making YouTube videos an awful lot as sort of a journal too. Um, you know, just like, well, anyways. <clears throat> I use it as a journal. Okay, so that is, uh, so I picked canola for 1095. We went over uh, why I pick, uh, why I like the, or the, the vegetable based quenching fluids. The fact that canola works a little bit better after it's been cooked, um, you know, just through use and everything. Um, and then it starts breaking down after about a year or so. All right, so the next thing is going to be our quenching tank. Okay, now. I actually did clean up, we're going to drop this down, and we're going to work off the floor here for a little bit. There we go. Let's clamp you down. <clears throat> okay, so. These here are my two most used quenching tanks. All right. This one right here is the one uh, that we're probably going to end up using the most, the, the, the narrow one. And it is a, it says Wilton 16 by 4.5 by 3.5 inches. This one right here, I believe I got this out of the salvage yard. Um, I don't know if it's a cake pan or, 
or what it is, but it's some sort of stainless steel pan. This one right here, just a second ago, I actually, or before I got on the film, I actually uh, cleaned it out with some gasoline. Um, you can see all this gunk. I actually didn't realize that that gunk is actually that thick. I mean, that's, that's probably like a, an eighth of an inch thick coating of gunk on the top. And what that is is just, um, you know, you do a batch of knives. <clears throat> well, you fill this up with your, your quenching fluid. You do a batch of knives. You drain the fluid out, you wipe everything down best you can, you stick it up underneath the forge tree until the next time. Well, you know, that, that canola oil just, um, you know, it just builds up over time. And so uh, this one right here I need to uh, clean out also. These right here, all they are is a piece of, I believe they're stainless, but I guess it doesn't really matter if it's stainless or not. Um, just pieces of steel or metal, whatever it is that you got. And then you drill and tap four holes, one at each corner. These right here, I believe, are toilet bowl bolts. Extra toilet bowl bolts that come in the kit, you know, like with a <clears throat> toilet bowl gasket kit. Well, you know, a lot of times the bolts have already been shortened and they're, um, they're in good condition, so you're just replacing the, the gasket, right? So you usually end up with a whole lot of more of these bolts. And they're brass bolts, and they work really good in this application. So you drill and tap four holes, you know, for these bolts, and then you drill as many holes as you can into that, that steel, right? So what you have is you have an adjustable quenching table, okay? Now, I've told you all before that I like doing a, um, no, let's not go there yet. <clears throat> Okay, so you might be asking yourself, well, why do I have two different quench tanks and they look completely different? They do have the similarities in that they both hold oil and I have tables for both of them and the tables are adjustable in depth, right? Okay, so your oil, the oil cools better when it's hot, okay? Um, and that kind of takes a little bit of getting used to the thought of that, okay? And kind of the idea is that when the oil is cold, it doesn't flow very fast, okay? So if you were to take a cup of oil, well, <clears throat> if you've ever changed your oil in your car, you, you can tell the big difference, you know, because you, you fire up the car, you let it idle for a little bit, or you drive it around the block or go down to the grocery store, and then when you come back, it's all nice and warm. You raise your car up, get up underneath there, loosen and, and pull your, your drain plug, and that oil just gushes out of there, right? I mean, it's not quite the consistency of water, but it's very fluid and um, very thin, right? You go ahead and you replace your drain plug, you know, pull your filter, change your filter, and then when you go to pour the new oil in there, even if it's the same grade of oil, say 1030, <clears throat> um, the, the new oil pours way slower and way thicker than the used oil, even though it's the same grade, right? Now, that oil is going to be broke down a little bit, you know, over the 3,000 or however long it's been since you changed it. But the big difference is, is that, you know, the new oil is cold. I mean, room temperature, 70, 80 degrees, is way colder than, you know, a 180 degree engine, okay? So the same thing goes here. Once that oil gets warmed up, it's a lot more, uh, it flows faster, which means that it also conducts the heat away faster. And I guess would probably be about the easiest way to explain it. <clears throat> but you get that oil too hot, um, and then it starts uh, not cooling quite as fast, and you start running the risk of a fire, Okay. So, and you'll, you'll notice it, man. I mean, once, you know, let's say you got to quench a batch of 20 knives and you push that oil too far or you don't have the right shape of quench tank, you'll start seeing that oil, um, it, it'll be, it'll kind of like shimmer a little bit and then you'll quench the next blade in there and you'll start seeing um, flames kind of start and stop and start and stop and start and stop all over the surface of that, that oil. And it'd be best if you stop there. If you don't stop there and you go ahead and quench another knife or two or three, 
then at some point, bam, that oil is going to ignite and it's going to sit there and burn. Okay. Now the best way to put that out is to take a, um, um, you know, to smother it. Okay. Um, and that's where you just take a lid of some sort and then, you know, put it over the top. And honestly, I should probably have one handy. But, you know, I don't have one at the moment. In fact, we better, you know, that's a really good idea. I'm going to write that on my hand so I remember, uh, get a lid. I mean, it's been so long since I had something like that happen. Um, you know, that honestly, uh, well, honestly, I just haven't been running, I haven't been doing that, and I should. So this is a good, uh, a good thing. So the reason I have two different size and two different shape quench tanks here, I use this one when I'm quenching um, a lot of kitchen, uh, a lot of chef's knives. Okay, when I'm quenching a lot of big, as in big surface area um, knives, I use the big one because you're putting a lot more heat into that oil. All right. So you need a, a tank that's wider and creates more surface area on the top. That way it can dissipate that oil, okay? So that as you're putting heat into the oil, that oil's got enough surface area to be releasing it up into the atmosphere, all right? Now that might be more of a production knife maker um, sort of detail, but you know I'm showing you the way that I do things. When you're doing smaller blades, like the Neckers, um, pairing knives, um, <clears throat> the EDC knife that we're making through this video, you want a deeper, narrower tank because you're not putting as much heat into it. Okay, so what you need is you need to be able to heat that oil up and have that oil have less surface area so that you keep putting heat into it and it doesn't release all that heat back out, okay? Because you are gonna have, um, you know, start and stop cycles. We'll put the blades in there, we'll heat them up for seven to 10 minutes. During that seven to 10 minutes, this, this oil is just releasing heat, okay? You pull those blades out one at a time and you quench them, putting more heat into the oil then you put another batch into the kiln, heat, heat it up for 10 minutes, and that whole time this is just releasing heat. So choose the shape of your quench tank um, to, to match the blades that you're quenching so that you, know, you manage your heat well. All right? Okay. So, and then every once in a while clean the dang things because they get all kind of grimy and nasty looking, right? Um, and... Uh, keep a lid handy. Um, you know, I guess for this one right here, you could go like that, and that would, you know, uh, take the oxygen out. I'm going to have to find a piece of plate to keep handy on this. Um, yeah, and I've got that written down, so I'll do that before we, we actually go to quench. All right, now how much time do we got? We are at 28 minutes. Okay, oh. <clears throat> your quenching accessories um, yeah. see what I mean this stuff gets all gunky this right here you'll see this um, when we go to do the, the the chef's knives all this is is a rack so you quench your blade and then you stick it in the rack to where it, it keeps it held up and down um, that really nasty looking uh, railroad tie <coughs> railroad spike <coughs> You know, I'm going to go ahead and clean all this up before we do this batch, just because it's time. You need a good piece of heavy steel to stick in the kiln while it's coming up to temperature. And then you pull that out, and you just drop it into your quenching oil, and that does your preheat. You're shooting for something around 145 degrees. <coughs> Honestly, as long as you put a piece of steel in there and pull it out, and that, that oil runs nice and freely, you know that works just fine because I mean like the 30 or 40 knives that we have in there I think we've got like 10 8 inch chefs so 10 8 inch chefs by the time we get done doing three quenches each in this oil that's going to bring that temperature up at least a good 40 50 degrees so we'll probably end up around 180 200 degree mark by the time we're done quenching the batch of chefs knives okay so I think um 
Yeah, we went over our type of oil. We went over our quench tanks. We went over why we choose the oil. We went over why we choose the quench tanks or, and the sizes and everything. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. So I think. <clears throat> so I think what I'm going to do is going to go ahead and pull the blades out of the kiln. Actually, no. Uh, first, we'll go ahead and pull the. We'll pull these knives out of the kiln so you can see what they look like. Um, okay, we flip our switch off that kills the power to everything. Okay. Now, see all that. Well, I guess you can't see. Let's. Pull them all out first, and then you'll get to take a look. Make sure we didn't lose any. Oh, there's one. Sure we didn't lose any in there. Okay, so this is what they look like after the heat cycles. Okay, you can see they are covered in a very fine flaky scale type stuff. All right, and what that is is that is steel that um, has been burned away. You know, the out outer layer of it has been um, heated it up, heated up, and. I guess burned off for back, lack of a better term. <clears throat> but these are all in a nice, um, you know, the steel inside is all nice and happy now. So what we'll do is we'll take these over, over to the trash can, knock all this scale off and everything, and then get them split out into batches of three, and then put these batches of three across the bench, get the kiln heated up, um, get our quench tanks cleaned out, um, and then get them, uh, get oil in them so that they're, they're ready to go. Adjust the tables for a, a nice edge quench. And then um, we'll probably see you back here uh, once the kiln is hot and ready to go and our quench oil and everything is, is, uh, is prepped and ready. And then we'll probably go over <coughs> uh, the fact that I do an edge quench or differential hardening. The difference between edge quenching or the differences between edge the differences between a differential hardening, a differential tempering. Um, we can probably even go over um, oh why I grind everything or why I heat treat everything full thickness if I can. We can go over I guess if I remember um, using your thicknesses to do a differential heat treat. Uh, your pre the fact that you can grind a knife and use that to do a differential heat treat even at the same temperature with a full quench. It's kind of more of an advanced type of deal. Uh, an interrupted quench and the problems that I see with that. Um, yeah, we can just talk about a whole bunch of stuff like that while we're, while we're heat treating. Um, and we're not, I'm not going to have you watch me heat treat all of these blades. We'll probably just do <clears throat> a single quench or maybe two quenches on the, the knife pattern that we're working on. So, um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this video, and um, uh, we'll see you here in, oh, maybe an hour, something like that. And, uh, again, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can visit me on the web, caltoncutlery.com. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video, and we will see you next time.